by the German, and uh, he has been working in this area of cryptocurrency for quite a long time. Uh, as the processes speeds taper off, uh, the only way you can get more money for your more bank for your buck is to basically go parallel and so the currency, which has always been a complex topic, has become even more complex, even more relevant. And Peter has been mining this topic for some fairly interesting, and I would say, uh, really surprisingly interesting results. And uh, in the sense that people have been working with it for so long and there is so much to learn. And I heard a talk by him at the Network Industry Systems Seminar about a year ago, and I was really blown away by my talk. So I invited him to do this talk here, and I think you all, you're all in for a treat. So without further ado, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Oh. All right, so, so this work has uh, been done by myself and Dave Dice and uh, Wim Hesselink. Um, we basically somehow managed to get together and, and start working on this work. Um, so I think uh, the, the first thing I need to do is to introduce uh, what is concurrency and, and uh, what are we going to do with it. Um, so it turns out that um, we all live an amazingly concurrent and parallel life and every day as you're walking through the Davis Center you uh, run a gauntlet of things that you have to do with respect to concurrency. Um, so for example, there's, uh, you have to come at a particular time to hear a particular talk and that's called synchronization. All right, And it turns out synchronization is not that difficult. We can figure that out as long as we arrive. Uh, at the right time, uh, it's, it, it's a, an okay thing to do, and it's not too difficult. Uh, the other thing that's uh, hard when we're doing concurrency is something called mutual exclusion. And this also happens about once or twice a week in this building. You're walking down a hallway, and you get to a doorway. And a doorway is essentially a place where you don't want to have more than one person going through at a time. And what happens inevitably is you get to the doorway, and there's someone else there. All right? And so, the doorway is called a critical section, and you go through this cute little song and dance thing with the other person as you try and decide who, in fact, will go through the doorway, because you don't want to smash into each other, all right? And so uh, the, uh, the algorithm that actually ensures that you don't smash into each other is called mutual exclusion, and it protects the critical section. All right, now, how do we do that? All right, we have all sorts of techniques in our life that would do synchronization and also uh, have uh, mutual exclusion on certain shared resources. And you can do this either by software or hardware on the computer. And it turns out, sorry, let me back up, uh, of synchronization and mutual exclusion, mutual exclusion is the harder of the two. All right, um, and then there's two ways of doing this on a computer. You can do it by software or you can do it by hardware. And software is the harder of the two to do. All right, if you, if you have the hardware, it can actually make it quite simple. Um, there's algorithms, traditional algorithms, uh, that have existed for a long time. Um, they started with uh, two threads, so you just have two people at the doorway. And uh, there's these algorithms which you may have heard of, Decker's algorithm, Peterson's algorithm. And they ensure that only one person is in the doorway at a time. And obviously, we like to extend this from two to n. And there are software algorithms that do that. Um, they get more complex, obviously. And you may have heard of algorithms uh, like Lamport's Bakery algorithm, which deals with that, all right? Um, most of these algorithms require atomic uh, reads and writes. In other words, uh, when you're looking at memory, um, if I'm reading while you're writing, then I either read the value before you wrote or, the, or after you wrote. But I, do ne I never read uh, flickering results. In other words, I'm not allowed to read while you're actually in the process of writing and potentially see a, a different value. As well, if two people are writing simultaneously, we don't get scrambled bits, some of the re uh, number from one and some of the number from the other. So these algorithms sort of rely on some underlying atomicity to begin with. Maybe. We'll come back to that, all right? Um, and the hardware alternatives are these magical atomic read and write instructions, things like test and set and swap and compare and assign. 
and they take all of the, the heavy lifting away from the software algorithms, and they can actually take a many, many, many line software algorithm and reduce it down to two or three lines. They can do that because the hardware can cheat. The hardware can actually make assumptions that you cannot make in the software. All right, so the big question here is, who cares? Because if we've got these hardware instructions, and they obviously are better, meaner, cheaper, better, whatever, uh, let's just use them. And the answer is that there's awful lot of low-cost devices with processors. My presenter, all right, probably has a small CPU in it. And uh, you have cell phones, cameras, printers, all of these things have very, very cheap devices. They're running processors that are manufactured by PIC, ARC, Alter. Um, all of those companies make processors. Then you've probably never heard of them. But 90% of the processors on the planet are those, not the ones that you normally think about. All right? So they create, they're used to create literally billions of products every year, and they have these processors in them. And do they have atomic assignment or atomic instructions? Not a chance. All right. So you have these devices. You have them doing incredibly complicated things. And they have incredibly stupid processors on them. So what are you going to do? Well, in most situations, you would be forced to structure your software as event driven. So the question then is, could we actually write threaded software on these devices? And my answer is, of course we can, because we can use software solutions to deal with the synchronization and the mutual exclusion. All right, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to take the software, which is the hardest way of doing this. I'm going to take the mutual exclusion, which is the hardest, harder problem to solve. And I'm going to spend time showing you how you can do that. All right, here's an example of one of these devices. That's my MP3 player, or actually my AUG player, all right? Uh, I spent $30 for it. Uh, that means it costs $15 for the wholesaler, 5 bucks for packaging, 5 bucks for development. That leaves $5 for the parts, all right? Which means I maybe have $0.50 cents for the CPU in that thing. Is that $0.50 cents CPU going to have all the magic hardware? No, it's not, all right? What about those birthday cards that you get in the store for $5 and they play music? What version of Linux are they running? All right. So how can we do that? Well, we can do it if we act, and we can have full threading if we use these software solutions. All right. In fact, even NVIDIA's GPUs did not have hardware instructions till about five or six years ago. So there's an example of a very, very powerful piece of, of equipment that doesn't have that. All right, so what are the contributions of the work? Well, uh, we are, I'm going to show you a set of uh, end-thread software solution algorithms uh, with a hopefully a good explanation of how they work, all right? Um, and, uh, and most importantly, we have working implementations of them all. Um, these work and deal with all of the crazy artifacts that exist on computers, for example, the compilers and the hardware trying to break these algorithms. In the process of doing this, we even came up with a couple of new algorithms. Um, and then more importantly, I'm going to do a performance comparison. How do software algorithms compare against hardware algorithms? And at this point, I'd like you to, in your mind, say, OK, I think the software are going to be five times slower, an order of magnitude slower, two orders. Pick something in your head and set that aside. And then at the end, we'll see, in fact, how close you were. OK? All right, so again, let's go back to mutual exclusion. Let me define it so it's absolutely clear what we're talking about. The first thing and most important thing is that there's only one person walking through the doorway at a time. All right, so that's the most important rule. Second rule says that the threads uh, run at arbitrary speed and arbitrary order. So you can't make up rules like I'll go through the, uh, the door in the morning and you go through the door in the afternoon. Someone can arrive at any time in any order. Unless you're attempting to go through, you can't actually close the door on the doorway and lock it and walk away with the key to ensure that when you come back, you can get through. All right? The doorway is always going to be open. Here's an important one. When two of you arrive simultaneously and you start this cute little dance with each other, you can't do it forever. Somebody has to eventually give in 
and the other person walk forward. If you design an algorithm where they could stand out there dancing all day, that's not good enough. And finally, you have this little dance go on, and if somebody backs down so the other one can go through, and then they think, okay, now I've been really polite and backed down, and the other person goes through. If someone else comes along and they start to dance again, then if they back down and go through, eventually this person has to get through. If they can actually back down an infinite number of times and never get through the doorway, then again, that's a failure in your algorithm. All right, so it turns out there's no software solution that satisfies all five of these requirements if you only have one bit per thread. We'll, I'll even show you the algorithms, how close you can get, all right? All right, so let's take a look. How do we do this? We'll start off, oh, sorry. Um, first of all, we have to look at some implementation issues. Um, the uh, compiler, the uh, hardware is trying to break these algorithms, which is, again, uh, uh, why some people don't use them. It turns out that you need special things to say to the compiler, don't move code around or don't put things into registers. For example, here's a, a situation where if it puts this variable into a register, then what will happen is it will never actually read the variable when it changes by another thread and as a result this thing will spin forever so you have to put in words like volatile which say you must always grab a fresh value from memory sometimes you need to put in fences fences ensure that a read does not be, is not moved before a write if the read and write are at different places in memory. So here we're talking about a one a task and another task changing different, uh, one reading of a location in memory, one writing, and the compiler says, well, if you're reading here and you're writing over here, there's no reason I can't do them in that order. And so it will actually move things around and that can break these algorithms. Finally, um, if you're going to spin and you have to spin in all of these algorithms waiting for the other person to do something, you need to put in a pause. And the pause basically says to the hardware pipeline, don't keep filling this pipeline because you're just going to slow everything down. So there's some special magic when you're spinning. Um, the cache, all right? Always treat your cache nicely because if you don't lay things out nicely in the cache on proper cache boundaries, you can get uh, cache bouncing and all sorts of things that will slow your program down. Don't do divisions. Divisions are very slow, and so what we try and do is make sure that, the, that there's no divisions uh, when we have powers of two. Uh, in, in general, we, that was probably overboard. Uh, the compiler normally does that anyway. And again, here's another division when we're, when we're cycling through, and we manually remove those, but I still think uh, I, it, it probably was unnecessary. Okay, uh, the other thing we're going to do here is we uh, want to have a self-checking critical section, our doorway wants to ensure that we do not get two people in there at the same time. So it turns out it's actually very difficult to verify all those five rules. Um, you need proofs, you need counterexamples, they're very difficult to construct. But what we can do is try and do something about rule one, which says that um, you don't want two people in simultaneously. So what's going to happen is when you walk up to the doorway, there will be a shared sign that everyone can see on the door frame, and you write your name on there, all right? And then you begin to walk through the doorway. And as you're walking through, you keep looking at the sign to make sure your name is still there. Because if someone else tries to sneak through at the same time, they will put their name there, they will overwrite your name, and then you will know that someone is going through the doorway at the same time as you. So we have our shared variable here. We set the shared variable when we enter the critical section, and we check it continuously as we're executing the critical section. This turns out to be amazingly important because it found so many mistakes in so many algorithms. All right, let's do it. Let's start. Let's, let's figure out an algorithm here. Let's build ourselves an algorithm to get through this doorway. So what we'll do is we'll start off with two variables, uh, or sorry, two values saying, I don't want to go through the doorway, I want to go through the doorway. And then we'll give each one of us a bit. And you can set that bit to, yes, I want to go through the doorway, or no, I don't want to go through the doorway. All right, let's do it. Let's have an algorithm. So what we do is we walk up to the doorway, and we say, I want to go in. And then what you do is you check the other person. And if the other person wants to go in, then you wait for them. And when they 
finish going through the doorway, they will retract their intent here, saying they don't want to go through the doorway. And now you'll notice that, and then you can go through the doorway. That's what we do. All right? Doesn't work. Absolutely doesn't work. Because if the two of us walk up simultaneously and say, we want to go in, and then the two of us check that the other person wants to go in, we'll stand there saying, oh, I'll wait for you to go through the doorway. I'll wait for you to go through the doorway. All right? You go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. And we break rule four because we're standing there arguing and no one's going through the doorway. All right, so what are we going to do about that? Well, what happens, again, in real life is the following. We don't stand there infinitely saying, you go first, no, you go first. Someone backs down. Someone retracts their intent. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say, I want to go in. If the other person doesn't want to go in, then I'm good to go. In other words, there's no one there. I'll just go in, all right? So if they don't want to go in, we're done. If they do want to go in, we retract our intent very politely, and then we wait for the other person to come up. Now, this actually works very, very well, because that's 99.999999% of the time, that's what happens at the doorway. Somebody finally backs down, all right? But on a computer, you can have the following happen. Both of them declare their intent. Both see that the other person wants to go in. Both retract their intent. Both see that the other person has retracted their intent. Both of them go and set their intent. Both of them see the other person wants to go in, and so on and so on. So if they stay in perfect synchronization, again, they'll never go in, all right? But it really does work in practice. All right, can we fix this? Well, yes. If we go and we look at these old, old movies, what we see in these old, old movies is that if a man and a woman arrive simultaneously at the doorway, then the woman does the following. She says, I want to go through the doorway, and then she just stares at the man and says, I'm not backing down. I'm just going to stand here until you back down. And the man comes along and says, I want to go in, sees that the woman wants in, and so the man backs down and waits for the woman to go through. All right? And this actually solves the problem uh, for two of the four cases. All right? um, and uh, that's fine, but uh, what, we would, what we see here is that after the man backs down, if another woman comes along, or she sneaks around and comes back again, all right, then she can prevent, or they can prevent, the man from ever going through the doorway. And so the man would actually starve. All right, so there we go. That, we're, but we're close. We are really, really close. We solved actually the first four rules. We just need to solve one more rule. How do we do that? How are we going to solve that last rule? Well, closing this turns out to be slightly complex. One uh, idea is alternation. And the idea behind alternation would be that we would take turns going through the doorway. And uh, that actually doesn't work out because uh, if you're not using the doorway, then uh, you can't prevent someone from using it. So if I went through the doorway, I would effectively be the last one that went through the doorway. And then if I tried to go through the doorway a second time, I couldn't. I couldn't go through again until the other person went through. All right? Now, the other person's off some other place, and, and I'm yelling, hey, let me through the doorway. You're preventing me from going in. Saying, I'm, not, I'm not even there. All right, so what's the problem? And the answer is, well, the algorithm effectively is preventing the other task to go through. So you're allowed to go through the doorway as many times in a row as you want when the other person isn't there. This, is, this won't work. OK, but we can actually grab this idea and use it to fix the problem that we have here, all right, to ensure some kind of fairness. Uh, in this particular scenario. And the first person to actually get an algorithm work was Theo Decker, back in around 1964 or 65, around there. And this is the algorithm. And it just builds up on the ideas that we've just talked about. And the ideas are the following. And that is that uh, when, you, uh, oops, when you come along, uh, you simply declare you want to go in. And if the other person doesn't want in, you just go ahead. But if they do want in, then what you do is you look to see who was last in the bathroom, sorry, in, uh, in the doorway, all right? Normally I do a bathroom, but I decided I'd do a doorway here. It might be safer. Um, so 
who was last through the doorway. And the idea is that whoever was last through the doorway is the low priority. All right? In the case of the man and the woman, the woman always had the high priority. The man always had the low priority. Now what we do is whoever was last through the doorway is the low, and then the other one switches to the high. So by alternating, then we will ensure that when we have simultaneous arrivals, one of the two will always get through. So that's the basic idea here. And the key is that we're only using the alternation when we have simultaneous arrivals. If the other person isn't there, we don't look at that aspect. So initially, we would say that uh, alternating doesn't work. And that's true. But alternating does work when there's always two people there simultaneously. OK, now it turns out that uh, this algorithm is not read-write-safe. And what, what I mean by read-write-safe is that um, it would work if bits were flickering or bits were scrambled on assignments and reads. Now, the, the reason there's a, there's a sad smile here is because for 20 years, I taught CS343 students that it was safe, that even if bits flickered, um, and, or bits were scrambled, this algorithm is rock solid. And in fact, look at this. I have put flickering into the uh, uh, Decker's algorithm. I am, I, before I actually do this assignment, I, I flick it back and forth a hundred times, on and off, on and on and off a hundred times. Then finally I set it, and it works. Magically, somehow the algorithm knows when the flickering has stopped, and you've actually set the value and proceeds. All right? This runs. It's absolutely mind-blowing that it runs. But there's four months ago, my co-author sent me an email saying, I found a counterexample. So if, in fact, one of the tasks eventually leaves, and there happens to be a flicker in just the wrong place, then one of the tasks will get stuck up here. Oh, that was sad. That was so sad, all right? But hold that thought. OK, so there we go. Um, there's another way you can do this, and that's uh, doing races. And that's where uh, tasks, uh, instead of alternating, they actually do some kind of a race to see who does something first. And this is called a read race. And the idea here is that you first say, say that you want to go in, then you read the other person's value, and then you do it as an exclusive or. And the question is, who can read first? All right. Now, um, I have a horrible time understanding this. It blows my mind. And the only way I can understand it is to write down all possible values for all possible scenarios and convince myself that they all work. And so that's what I've done here. And I'm not going to explain it in detail. But essentially what happens if t0 goes first, then what we see for all the cases is that the two values that will be read are different. If t1 goes first, then what we see is the two values that are read will always be the same. That's if they go one after the other. If they actually run in parallel, the exact same kind of thing happens. So this actually is a way of, of telling that uh, you have won a race. And if you race alone, what happens is uh, the, this causes a switch. And because it causes a switch, it means you can't sneak back in. Because if you try and sneak back in, it'll say, no, you've been here before. You're not going to be the highest priority one. All right? This is what read write unsafe um, because of the simultaneous reads and, and a write that occurs at one other location. OK, then there's two, uh, there's the right race. Now, this is uh, Peterson's famous algorithm. Probably everybody knows this algorithm. In Peterson's algorithm, what you do is you first declare your intent, and then the, you race with the other person at the doorway to see who can put their name into a box the, f the fastest, all right? So we arrive at the doorway. There's the box on the table. And someone yells, go, and bam, we put our name in the box, all right? Then we both look in the box to see who got their name in. All right? And the question is, who won? Who's the winner when the race is over? And the hard part I found with this algorithm is when I would see my name in there, I'd go, I won. All right? But that's wrong, because their name was underneath my name, and I overwrote it. So they wrote first. I wrote over top of them. I was the second writer. I lost. All right, so that's the trick there. And once you do that, again, the, what we're doing here is first we check if the other person wants in. If the other person doesn't want in, we don't even check the race. There's no need to. So the only time we do this is when I want to go in and they want to go in. And then we'll do that extra check there. 
All right, so we have three possible ways that we can try and deal with this. All of them work, and all of them can be combined with those algorithms to make everything work correctly for our two-task case. So let's do it. Let's go to n. Let's see if we can build an n-task algorithm. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the pieces that we've already got, and I'm going to put them together to get an algorithm. All right, this is basically the way this algorithm works, and I have to stand in the middle here and pretend I'm a task. I'm task 5. I come along, and I've been assigned bit 5, or, or location 5. That's my bit. And so I want to go in uh, through the doorway, and so I'm going to put a check mark there saying I want in. Then what I do is I stand and I point in this direction, and everyone in this direction has high priority. All right. So it turns out your position is also your priority. Uh, for some reason or other, the people that do this work have a slow number, meaning high priority. It's just to confuse you. All right. So all the people in this direction have high priority. I walk along, and if I find someone with high priority that wants in, then what do I do? I come back. I retract my intent. I remove this, and I watch them, and I wait for them to finish. Eventually, there'll be a moment in time when I've walked along here and I didn't see anybody with, that wanted in with higher priority. So I swing back around and I have my check mark still there because I didn't retract it. And I now go this direction in the low priority. And if I find somebody who has wants in with lower priority, do I retract my intent? No. What I do is I just leave my intent and I wait for them to retract their intent, which they will because eventually they'll see my intent here, and then they'll take it away, all right? So eventually, I'll get all the way to the end here, and I will have seen no one with higher priority that wants in, no one with lower priority that wants in, and I can now go in. Now, there's probably, you're sitting there, there's a 1,000 cases you're going, but what if, but what if? I'm not going to do the what ifs, all right? It works, all right? So. There we go. We have this algorithm. And you can see it. Basically, you start off and say you want to go in. Then you go in the high priority direction. If you find someone in the high priority direction that wants in, you retract your intent and you wait for them. Once that's done, you go back and you start the whole process over again. So that's phase one. Phase two says go the other direction. If you find someone that wants in, you just watch until they retract their intent. All right. That just puts together everything that we've just talked about. The only problem is this has starvation. And it has starvation because if I'm 5 and a 0, 1, 2, or 3 are constantly coming in, I will never, ever get to the end. So we need some way of figuring out how to solve that problem. All right, now it's going to get ugly. Because this is the first end task solution. Check it out. And it's largely incomprehensible. All right, the thing I showed you, you probably have a warm feeling. You say, I, I think I understand that based on the other little bits. There's nothing in here to grab a hold of. It's just code, all right? It does use a right race um, to, to solve some of the problems, but it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to understand. And uh, Dijkstra's uh, uh, included this solution along with the original two solution. It turned out that uh, not more than six months later, Knuth said this is rubbish because it has starvation. And Knuth then published this, which is equally as opaque, and said, this solves the problem, because what, what Knuth said was that what you really need to do to solve this problem back here is you need to somehow cycle. If you can cycle through the priorities, remember we, we fix the other problem by alternating? Well, what, what if we cycle around sort of with the priorities somehow, then it, we will fix the problem, all right? And that's exactly what um, Knuth said. And so this is what Knuth does. He cycles along right there, the, the blue line. Um, and it turns out that um, he does a really rubbish uh, way of cycling. In fact, it's so rubbish that he even says uh, the worst case bound uh, is 2 to the n minus 1, which is a big bound, all right? Furthermore, um, what he does is he says, here's an example of how uh, the bound starts. And he, g and he goes through a three task for one step and says, I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader to actually figure out how that number comes out of that. All right. So it turns out that we actually uh, gave the proof for this. Um, 
And in the meantime, uh, De Bruyne came along, and De Bruyne said, um, well, you know, uh, Knuth, you're, this is a really rubbish way of cycling around to get fairness. Um, all you need to do is put in these, uh, get rid of the blue line and put in these two green lines. And if you do that, then the bound is this, which is way, way, way smaller. And again, um, didn't give any explanation where the bound came from, and we actually proved the bound. Oh, by the way, um, proving this bound involved um, the towers of Hanoi, just uh, as a point of fun interest. Okay, so uh, these things, though, are not first come, first serve, because when you're cycling, um, you're going to pick the next, next person in the cycle, but that isn't necessarily the, the person that uh, last arrived, all right? They could be behind that. Um, and these are read, write, unsafe as well. All right, we have this lovely ditty uh, by um, Eisenberg and uh, Maguire. All right, um, and what they did is they said the way to do this cycling is to start off and um, I put these actually in a loop. So if you took that band that I had and you wrapped it around, not into a Mobius strip, but just around, um, what you can do is you, you designate one as the highest priority and you key off of that for everything. And then as soon as this one finishes, what it does is it looks ahead and finds the next one that's waiting here. And then it just rotates this so that the zero gets pulled down to here. And then all of the other things then key off of that new position. And so that ensures that we get, again, a good cycling. Um, and that's fine. That's okay. But it's still not first come, first serve because People can come in at any order into the cycle. So Lamport basically said, this is all rubbish. Let's do it properly. Let's get first come, first serve, and introduce the bakery algorithm. And so this is the bakery algorithm. It's fairly complicated. But it turns out that Hainer and Siam Sunder uh, came up with a simpler version of this algorithm. And I love this algorithm. It's the one I teach. Um, and uh, they used a couple of tricks to, to make it really, I think, easy to understand. So I'm going to actually talk about this version. So in this version, what you have is a situation where uh, you're going to use tickets. And the tickets are going to establish your position. And if we take tickets, then that means we'll get first come, first serve. So it's just like going into a bakery. You have a machine. You get a ticket. And then you, you watch the now serving sign. And so the order that people come in is the order they're served. All right. The problem is that to get a uh, machine that will give you a ticket, you have to have an atomic machine, because otherwise two people can take the same ticket. And we're trying to build um, a mutual exclusion, and so we would have to have mutual exclusion already in the machine to get this. So here's what a Lampert bakery actually looks like. You walk in, and you say, yo, show me your tickets. Everybody holds up their ticket. And you look around, doing a linear search, and you find the largest ticket value. You add one to that, and you write it on a sheet of paper, and that's your ticket. All right? So that's how we're going to do that. The problem is two of us can walk in. Two of us can yell, yo. Two of us can walk around doing a linear search and find exactly the same largest ticket value. And two of us can then end up with the same ticket. So what we're going to do in that case is we're then going to fall back on your position. All right. So five and six both have ticket 18. Five has higher priority than six. Now immediately you're going, not going to work, not going to work. You're going to get starvation. Five can jump back in, and five can get ahead of six again. Wrong. Because if five actually goes out and comes back in again, it has to get a ticket that's greater than 18. All right. So it can't rush ahead and jump ahead of six again. All right, so there's the idea. And what they did that was so cute was they stole two ticket values. They stole the value infinity, and they stole the value 0. And the idea is that once I've selected my ticket, I'm going to walk along here. So I, let's say I have the ticket 20. I'm number 8. So I say, does 0 want in? No, it's infinity. 1 want in? No, it's infinity. 17 wants in? Yes, I'm 20. They're 17. I have to wait for them. They have higher priority. 3 doesn't want it in, 4 doesn't want it in, 5, five wants in, it's 18, I'm 20, they have to go, I wait for 6 to go, uh, 0, 7 has a 0, 0 is the, is, the, is the highest possible ticket value, all right? What does that mean? Well, it means that 7 is actually trying to figure out what their ticket is, all 
All right? So they're in there. We know they're in there, but they haven't got a ticket value yet. So we'll wait for that zero to suddenly change into a 21. When it changes into 21, I've got 20. I can keep going. I skip myself. I find 9 is choosing a ticket, and I wait for 9 to finish with its ticket. It picks 22, and finally I can go in. All right? So there we go. That's how this whole thing works. The problem is, of course, we, can, we don't have an infinitely large ticket. All right? And so the tickets can actually roll over. So that can cause the algorithm to fail. And there's various ways the ticket can roll over. But it does have the following magic property. If, in fact, you ever get a situation where no one's actually in there waiting, the tickets automatically go back to zero. And then they'll start rising again. So if you have those moments where there's no one going to the doorway, the doorway immediately resets to a zero ticket value. Um, the magic of this is that it is first come, first serve. And it's also, believe it or not, it's read, write, um, sorry. The original algorithm is first come, first serve, and it is read, write, save. If you have, um, if you have flickering or you have scrambling, this actually will work, all right? And it's an end task solution. Um, th this one doesn't. There's some, there's some things that we do to, to make it uh, meaner and cleaner, and those cause um, it to be non-read, write, save. OK, um, Burns. Uh, Burns uh, had a paper, and he put four algorithms in there. The first one is just a straightforward uh, change on Dijkstra's algorithm by putting some of the arrays together. The second one um, is this algorithm. Um, and we managed to make it run a little faster. Uh, but it turns out we also discovered it has starvation. All right. Um, the third algorithm in the paper is just a canonical um, modification to the second. And the fourth algorithm in the paper is absolute rubbish, doesn't work at all. All right. So again, this is the thing. We would go through these papers and find these algorithms. And many of them have long, complicated proofs that, that establish correctness. All right. OK. So Peterson. Peterson, along with his two-task algorithm, also published an n-task algorithm. And on the surface, this one looks like it's really going to work well. So the idea here is that everybody races, and someone loses the race. And that one has to wait. And the other ones all move forward. They all race. The loser of that stays, and these move forward. Then these two race, and then this one moves forward. It looks like it's going to work real, really well because you move along quickly and there's less and less competition so that you're not spending large amounts of time um, asking questions. It turns out this algorithm, again, is absolute rubbish. And it's rubbish because if I race alone, there's no one else but me, I come along here and if I, if I race alone in this algorithm, I'm the loser. And I just sit there. All right? And so there's this little bit of blue that was added to make this work. And the little bit of blue says, if there's no one ahead of you, then you don't have to sit there. You can move forward. All right? But the thing about this is that what happens is that as soon as someone moves forward here, nobody can move forward there. And so what happens is everybody sits here, one sits here, and one sits here. You don't get any of the positive effects of this algorithm. Everybody is basically just arguing up in that, or spinning up in the first column. All right? This is this when you run this algorithm, it just runs amazingly slow. Okay. Then Lamport said the following. He says, you know, when people arrive at doorways, there's nobody ever there most of the time. So like, why are we worried about this situation so much? So what Lamport said is, let's optimize what's called the fast path, which is arriving and there's no one there. So it turns out that Lamport's fast algorithm has exactly five writes, those are the blues, and two reads, those are the green, and that's the absolute minimum you need to get through. And as a result of this, when you arrive, you do five, uh, sorry, seven quick operations and you're through the doorway. It turns out that if that's not true, there is somebody else there, then the rest of this algorithm is, is not very good. Okay, But the fast part is good, and the rest, yeah. But it also has starvation. All right, So that's not good either. It's really not buying us a whole lot. What about the minimal bits? Remember I said you can't get by with one bit. Well, you seem to be able to get by with about maybe three, four, or five bits. All right. So there's a number of algorithms that show that it's possible to do this. One of these I'll, I'll flash up here. There, there's one of them with three bits. Um, 
Essentially, you're trading uh, space and time here, and so uh, because you have so little space, you're going to spend an awful lot of time zooming around, copying and doing and checking and checking and checking. So these don't run very fast, but if you, don't, if you only have a couple bits of memory, they will work fine. Um, there, there is also some funny magic in these algorithms. It's, there's stuff in here that makes me go, ooh. Um, so, and it has to do with this copying here, which I still struggle to understand. All right, what can we do, though, to try and fix this? Because these algorithms are just impossible to understand. What we do is we go back and we look and we, we think outside the box, or so just think in a different way. And what, what you can do is simply do a, a divide and conquer. We know we can build these ones with just two, and so what you do is you organize these twos um, into a tree, and you start off at the top with everybody fighting in a two-way battle, and then they go down and fight in another two-way battle, and they fight in another two-way battle. And all of the good properties here must apply here and must apply there. So if we get it right in the two level, then it will actually be right all the way down the tree. And you can do this, you can build a minimal tree, binary tree, or, sorry, a maximal binary tree or a minimal binary tree. Some, you know, they, they both have different kinds of properties that you might. You, uh, want to um, optimize. You can even do a D retreat. So if you had a gr an algorithm here that could do three instead of just two, not a problem. All right. Um, it reduces scanning and retries. The key thing here is that you have to retract in uh, reverse order. So let's say T1 works its way down to here. It's going to own this, it's going to own this, and it's going to own that. All right. Now, when it finishes, the critical section it comes out, it could go up here and say, I'm now going to release this, I'm now going to release this, I'm now going to release that. Wrong. Because if you do it in that order, as soon as you release this, T1 sees that it's released, it then moves forward here and it puts the flag up here saying, I'm going to use this, and T0 comes along and says, oh, I have to put this flag down. And so it invalidates T1's operation. All right, so do it from the bottom up and you're good to go. All right. Ah, oh, this, this was the first tournament algorithm, all right? Uh, oh, I have pain. This was painful. It took us weeks and weeks and weeks to get this algorithm to work, all right? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, so that apparently is the first tournament, uh, published tournament algorithm. It turns out Lynch um, simplified it um, and came up with this algorithm, uh, which was a little uh, less difficult. But after you really look closely at these algorithms, and you don't really want to, um, what you discover is they're not actually doing a tree walk, not like you would expect. In fact, what they're really doing is they're sort of doing what Peterson did. Um, essentially, what happens is T0, whoops, T0 starts off and it fights with its partner. And then after it's fought with its partner, the winner then goes and fights with the other two that are next to it. And then after it's done, the winner is from there, that one goes and fights with the four that are on the other side of the tree. All right? So it's, I think it's getting a, a logarithmic reduction, but it's not really what you would consider to be a tree walk. So who had the first tree walk? Well, the first one I could find was, uh, was Gabby's um, tree walk um, in his uh, book, all right? And uh, this, is, this is the code for this. And of course, as I, when I typed it in, it didn't work. All right, failed immediately. Um, and the reason it fails immediately is because he has an off by one error here, which I told him about, and he was shocked. Uh, but turns out there's some other people that found it and fixed it as well. Um, and uh, that's fine. And it turned out that, that the reason I was really looking for this was because Martin was teaching 343, and he says, you don't have any example of a tournament algorithm. Why don't you put one in the notes? And so that's how this, in some ways, how this whole thing began, was me going off and finding this uh, tournament algorithm. So I looked at this for a while, and I said, you know what? You can do better than this. And so this is the optimal algorithm, all right? This, this has exactly three shifts and one exclusive or, and you're done. All right, and that's my baby. And it really runs like the wind. OK, so this is, um, this is how we can do this. Um, but it turns out Kessel also uh, showed a, an interesting way of doing this. Kessel uh, adopted a minimal tree, uh, whereas the other one is a maximal tree. And um, in, in this approach, uh, again, you, you walk the tree. And because Kessel invented a read race, he wanted to use read races uh, in, the, in the individual boxes. The problem with this algorithm is that you need to remember on the way down how to get back up again. 
And so what you're remembering at each step as you walk down is, did I go left or did I go right? Did I go left or did I go right? Then you use that information so that you can walk up the tree and you know which directions that you walked. So that's fine. Coded this up, had it running. Woke up one morning and I said, you know, when you, if you're T3, you always walk the same way, right? It's not like you need to figure it out every time you arrive. You know ahead of time, a priori, you know what you're going to do. So what did I do? I just created a table. That's it. I created a table. And now the entire algorithm is you walk down the tree, you look up some items in the table, and you do a little bit of a race at each one of those nodes. And when you get to the bottom, you walk back up the tree. You have a loop going in the other direction. You use your table values, and you're done. Now, everyone in the room can understand this algorithm, all right? We started off with gibberish algorithms, and now we have an algorithm that's so easy to explain, this is not a hard problem any longer, all right? And it runs like the wind. Very good, very fast algorithm. Okay, so let's add something into the mix. Let's add some hardware into the mix, because we would, I, 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 I poked you earlier and I said, how fast do you think software algorithms are going to be to hardware algorithms? So let's pick three. Let's pick a spin lock. Uh, this is the uh, Mellicrumian Scott algorithm, which is a, a very nice algorithm. And good old p-threads lock, just a standard lock that you would get out of a library. All right, and we'll use those as comparisons against our software algorithms and just see how bad our software algorithms are, all right? All right, so we're going to perform an experiment. We're going to perform two kinds of experiments. A maximal experiment, where we have maximal contention. We pound on, on our lock as hard as we possibly can, and we see how many times the task can get in and out of the critical section. So we're going to get a throughput result. And we'll also do a minimal experiment, where we have one thread. And what it does is it goes through to see what the cost is when there's nobody else there. How expensive is the algorithm? And because we only have one thread, what we'll do is we'll actually have it hop around at different starting points. So it's not like it's the same thread that warms one path. It will, in fact, jump from place to place, and so it will warm different paths or different parts of the data structures. All right? OK, and so we're looking for higher aggregate counts, which means um, we get um, uh, better performance. All right, so there's the idea. And we're going to run this on an AMD and a Spark. The Spark's a, a bit long in the tooth, but nevertheless, uh, it's a different architecture. And in fact, what you can see here is the Spark behaves very differently from the AMD for this simple test. And this simple test is basically um, a microcosm of what we're trying to do. It has a volatile shared variable, which we're going to uh, keep changing, and it has a and just by doing this, we can get a sense of the differences in architecture. And we see there's a dramatic difference in architecture. So we'll expect quite different results from these two machines. All right, so, whoa, there we go. All right. Um, there's some results. Um, this over here is maximal. Uh, this is minimal. Um, what can I try and pull out of this? Because uh, there's way too much information. The key thing is that for some reason or other on the AMD, spin locks are very fast. I have a funny feeling they did magic on their processor to make that happen. But what's really important is right here. Because right here, we have MCS. And MCS is a very, very good hardware algorithm. And what we see on top of that is Peterson Viewer. All right, so there's my algorithm, and it's as good as one of the hardware algorithms. All right, not lower, not lower by an order of magnitude. It's spot on. All right, so that, that I think that kicks butt. Um, all right, over on this side, what we see is that uh, the hardware algorithms are, have constant time no matter how many tasks arrive. And right there, this line here is uh, Leslie uh, Lamport's fast software algorithm. And again, you can see it's flat. So we're looking for algorithms that are flat. Those are going to give us nice, constant performance when there's no one arriving. The rest of them, as you can see, all degrade as uh, you add more. Um, uh, you make the, the data structures larger, and you still have to traverse through those.
Okay, that was the AMD, the Spark. As I said, you're going to get completely different results. Um, again, the key thing here is that up at the top, we have my algorithm, all right? It's right there, uh, that blue line, and it's up there with the winners. And again, over here, we see a couple of straight lines, and those straight lines uh, correspond to um, the Lamport Fast or the hardware algorithms. Okay, so what's the conclusion? Well, the original papers are difficult to read and understand. What I really mean is they're impenetrable, all right? They are unbelievably difficult. <laughs> Generating those implementations for all those algorithms was unbelievably hard, all right? Now, in fairness to all these people, I know I've rubbished, I, I don't mean to rubbish their work. This stuff is unbelievably hard, and, and, the, and the solutions are unbelievably amazing. And none of these people had a multiprocessor on which to test any of this stuff, all right? So really, all they could do was think about it and hope that they got all the cases. And it turns out a lot of cases were not covered correctly. I've used literally thousands of CPU hours to run and test these programs. Thousands, all right? Um, when we started this, our expectation was that software algorithms would be an order of magnitude slower. We thought it, maybe we, we were just being conservative and they might only be five times slower. Man, we're spot on. We can hit a hardware algorithm. Um, so it turns out that if you don't have atomic instructions, all right, or even, or even atomic assignment, um, that should not deter you from building threaded programs on these low-level devices, embedded systems um, add, that have preemptive threading. It's a viable a design technique. All of this code, all of these algorithms is available here at this uh, GitHub repository. But wait, there's more. Because most of these algorithms either work for the maximal case or the minimal case, all right? None of these algorithms work well for both cases until this one. This algorithm we just invented about three months ago, and this algorithm takes Leslie Lamport's FAST algorithm, and what we do is we modify it so if it discovers you're not the f along the FAST path, it immediately kicks you over into a tournament algorithm, which is amazingly fast, all right? And so everybody is really over here competing except for one person who's designated themselves as the fast path person, and they proceed down here. Then you take the winner from here and the winner from here, and you go through a simple Peterson's two thread, and that then makes a decision as to who's going to go in. All right? So in our case, we have seven uh, reads, writes uh, from Lamport's, and five from Peterson for a total of 12 accesses, and that's the uh, maximum number of things that you have to do if there's nobody there. Um, and we get amazingly good performance when we get maximal contention. And unlike Leslie Lamport's algorithm, ours has no starvation. All right? So we got it all. And what's, again, here is these two purple lines, because these two purple lines are our new triangle algorithm, called triangle algorithm because of the triangle. Um, and these two, again, are sitting right above MCS. So we're still, we're, we're totally competitive. And if you look over here, there they are, totally flat, all right? Absolutely flat, just like Lamport's. Now, remember, we've got five more accesses, so we can't be as fast, but we still have that beautiful quality of being flat, all right? Okay. But if you phone our operators right this moment, they have a special offer. And the special offer is that if you take Decker's algorithm, which doesn't have the read-write-safe property, and you make a couple of changes to it, you have a version of Decker's that's now read-write-safe. This is about one month old. It's, we, we're, still, we, we're still writing the paper on this, all right? And so, so what are you going to do with this? What, what you're going to do with this is you're going to take it, and you're going to bung it into the triangle algorithm, which uses Peterson all over the place to make decisions, get rid of the Peterson two-thread, and put in the new Decker. And now you have a triangle algorithm that's read-write safe. So now you have an algorithm that works on machines which have rubbish hardware, all right? They have almost nothing and you can do multi-threading on those systems.
All right, and if we look at these pictures, they're really hard because these are, these are hot. Uh, I took these uh, off the machine today. And this little these little blue lines that are right here are the triangle algorithm with the new deckers. And as you can see, they're fairly competitive. They're obviously going to be touch slower, but they're still right up there with the other algorithms. OK. There's no more offers. I'm done. All right. Questions? Oh. Yes, question. Um, uh, any compiler will cause this code to work incorrectly. And that's why I started off by saying one of the contributions was to get all of this code to work correctly. And so we have sprinkled fairy dust into all of these algorithms so that they will run on a machine that's at the level of TSO. And TSO is one of the memory model levels that's standard on the x86 and on the Spark. If you want to go to something like a, an ARM, then you, we would have to maybe sprinkle a tiny bit more fairy dust in there. But so if I open GitHub and take your code and run it on my machine, it will work. It will work. It will work. Uh, 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 do you have an ARM? Do you have an ARM, or do you have an x86 or? A... I have, I have okay. <laughs> All right. I may in the future buy a smartphone. Okay. There is an incredibly high probability that it will work, yes. It will probably work. It would, uh, yeah, because there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to have an x86, and it's all set up to run on an x86. That's, but, but, but the compiler is not going to risk it. No. I've, got all, I've, I've sprinkled fairy dust for the compiler, and I've sprinkled fairy dust for the hardware. All right. The compiler is actually doing its thing correctly. The compiler will, yes. We, the compiler is told to lay off in exactly the ne necessary place. And, and actual compilers actually do lay off until. Yes. All right. I'm okay. That's, that's the impressive part. <laughs> yes. Uh, why is our kind of sensing an issue for cheap devices? Because uh, they feel like it should only be issues on multi processors. Because I mean, on a single processor, you're go always going to have your device complete. Okay, on a single processor, if you have preemption. But the preemption can't, can't go in between, in, in the middle of it. No, but it, if all you need is preemption and you can be interrupted between any two instructions, and then that can cause failures in your program. Why? I mean, like, why don't you say, uh, why don't you say pro No, 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 it just, you just can, you can just cause problems, uh, because. I was just thinking about, like, why is why don't you say so, so let's back up. If we had a, a low-cost device that uh, had atomic assignment and, and had, no re, had no rewrite issues, we would still have problems because you can still get interrupted at arbitrary locations, and that could cause problems. The read-write safety only makes the burden larger. I mean, like, uh, I was just thinking that on a computer processor, why is all assignments implicitly atomic? Since how can they not be atomic? Not on these machines, because what's happening on these machines is that while you only have a single processor, you still have all sorts of buttons. And these buttons are transmitting data into memory. And as they transmit data into memory, there's no safety. The values just come from the button, and they're stuck into memory. And if you're reading that memory location to find out what the value of the button is, and, and the button's actually writing in there at the same time, then you will read rubbish. So like simultaneous access to memory doesn't imply well, if you think of the button as being another processor, then effectively it's a, it is two processors because it, the button is really a, another thread that's running on the system. Okay. Yes. Um, since the algorithms are subtle and contain some oh. errors, oh yeah. Did you think, as, uh, did you or other people think about formal verification? Absolutely. So uh, when when these new algorithms that we have, you know, we we uh, we do all of the what is it uh, spin and and uh, model checking and Wim is our theorist, all right. Wim is a, a raging theorist and and everything has to be formally proved and and so on and so forth. And so yes, we do that, okay. But um, what we have seen is situations where things can even be formally proved and then subsequently later on break because 
you know, it's on, the, the formal proof is only as good as your axioms and things that you've put in there. All right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, so it turns out that most of the people that do work in this area, they have no concept of how to actually run a performance experiment. And so a lot of the stuff that comes out does fail. OK. Are we done? One more. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, some of the original Burroughs machines made back in 1963, I believe, had multiple CPUs. Um, some of the CDC machines had multiple CPUs in the form of a single CPU, but they had I.O. channels, which were actually small CPUs. So the idea of concurrency has existed probably two weeks after someone actually invented the computer. <laughs> yes? Um, you could, like you showed your MP3 player. Or yeah. Toys R Us. <laughs> walk, I mean? walk into Toys R Us, you pick up a toy, a doll, and I mean, it speaks in seven languages. It has, it has uh, GPS, so it knows which language to speak. Um, it, it, it does face recognition, and it's doing it all on a 50 cent CPU. I, I, I don't know how they do that. So what are the processes that are competing for these? Uh, that at the very beginning, I showed you there's this list of companies that you've never heard of. Pick, Marvel. As you're driving around the back of the bay, Marvel owns about five buildings, giant buildings at the back of the bay. They probably produce more CPU processors than Intel, AMD, IBM, everybody combined. All right? What you're using is probably 5% of the market. So, but in the language of, of computer science, so what? What processes are they doing that? What, why, what's multi-threaded on those? What different processes are running? Well, they might be single processors. Or it turns out it's very cheap to bang down a bunch of cores. You can bang down four cores onto a chip, and it's very low cost, all right? But if you suddenly have to put a cache, or you have to guarantee cache um, rate, reads and writes are atomic, you're talking about adding $200 to the cost of the chip. All right, the, the, all those, when you see a chip, all those wires, that's the cost, and that's all of the extra stuff that you get on your high-end chip. But you don't actually need it. You can survive without it. It's not going to run as fast, all right? But it doesn't matter. It's just a doll, all right? <laughs> yes? Would it be safe to say, then, that, that there is a bunch of these chip manufacturers where there are applications running that aren't actually critical uh, to safety or, you know, where, where getting these things right really doesn't matter because, you know, the, the language comes out funny or, or the red light goes on before the yellow light or something. Like that. That, and, that, and that's fine. It's just my, my comment was much more about um, some people might say, okay, we need to write our software for the doll. All right, now we're, we're opening our discussion today at our group meeting, uh, and, and somebody says, well, we, we only have a 50 cent CPU. It doesn't have any atomic instructions, so we can't use threading. Bang. And immediately they go off and do uh, something else. My response is, no, don't throw that away. You have a design option that's absolutely viable, and whether you get it correct or not, or whether it matters if it's correct, that's a separate issue. I just want to indicate that there's a viable design. Okay. Thank you. All right.